So now we will shift uh, a little bit on the topic and we will uh, focus more on the very acute setting uh, on the patient with cardiogenic shock. So you could kind of say that the discussion will shift more from the door to balloon time to more to door to survival time. And in this setting, it's of great importance that all the disciplines are represented and the, the following talks will also both represent the perspectives of cardiologists and surgeons. And we'll start with the, the surgeon, uh, Dr. Anderson from Einstein Healthcare. Uh, and the uh, professor at Kimmel Jefferson uh, School of Medicine. Mark. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure and an honor for me to be here and, and be part of the faculty and, and have the opportunity to interact with the uh, attendees. I'd like to congratulate um, Noam and Kevin and, uh, for putting together the meeting and, and to thank Abiumed and, and really congratulate Mike and, and his group. And they've always been moving this, this topic and this concept forward and this meeting is certainly a, uh, a good demonstration of that. So my uh, job now is to switch gears a little bit and go to something, uh, to the clinical aspect here. And um, I can say that my talk will in no way be encumbered by the elegant data that you've heard uh, so far this morning. So um, just historically, and, and I think I like to put, to, to put this up in that, um, and I think you've heard it already, I like to refer to as cardiac surgeons as the original uh, unloaders. And, and that, you know, the development of cardiopulmonary bypass, you know, born out of the need to be able to operate on the heart was really the foundation of, of cardiac unloading. And although perfusion and, and all the techniques of perfusion have evolved, the, the one kind of fundamental that has not changed, and, and certainly as cardiac surgeons, we know that total cardiac bypass or um, what could be known as complete unloading is still the optimal uh, setting. And also, historically, um, I certainly should admit that while we were looking at, at cardiopulmonary bypass early on, the main goal was oxygenation and the, the struggles with a, an oxygenator and, and cardioprotection was secondary. But it became very real that cardioprotection, if we were to operate on the heart, cardioprotection um, was something that we certainly need to pay attention to. And cardioprotection in the operating room was certainly different than what was happening with a patient with acute myocardial infarction. Um, but the bottom line was that ischemia and reperfusion, as we've heard about, played a role uh, in, in both of these and that cardioprotective strategies uh, absolutely had to be uh, adopted. So um, fast forward to the present era, and I think we've heard uh, uh, um, really elegant discussions this morning that um, unloading and protection, and now we have uh, the concept of recovery, the role of unloading in recovery, and that it's very real. The one thing I, I, I think that's been alluded to, but perhaps hasn't been stated quite so frankly, um, is that survival and recovery are two separate things. And I think the data is very clear on that, that while we're getting survivors, they are returning, um, and the, the mortality associated with readmissions, heart failure, et cetera, has been um, really well documented this morning. So the, survivals, the survivors haven't necessarily recovered, and I think that's a, a very important point to take home from this meeting. So what is um, the surgeon's role? currently in an increasingly interventional uh, cardiology world. And, I, and I, I say this not just from a, you know, a heart failure transplant surgeon, but to include all surgeons in this. What is the role going to be in, in this um, concept of recovery? Well, I think one of the things that has gotten surgeons back into the game, um, so to speak, is that the um, Abiumed Impella got the indication for cardiogenic shock. So historically, the kind of uh, um, 
thought process was, you know, we were really focusing on interventional cardi cardiology, high-risk PCI, but now that we have the indication, both for um, cardiogenic shock, all the impella devices has kind of brought the cardiac surgeons back into the field. The other thing I think that's very important about the approval here was that heart recovery was actually mentioned in the language of this approval, which is really the first time that I think it had been acknowledged in, in these indications. And this is not to say that cardiac surgeons should only be involved in shock patients. There's certainly numerous different indications for cardiac surgeons to be involved, but it certainly helped us get back into the game. So. Um, it's certainly one of the concerns we had as, as cardiac surgeons or uh, in the field was when this technology came on the field that it was going to kind of be used, um, you know, without, uh, in, a, in a not truly thoughtful manner by our interventional cardiology colleagues. So we have really tried to move forward to make thoughtful decisions about the type of support that we're using. And this is, um, you know, kind of a very simple but elegant um, table that Dan and, and others have have put together to create something um, known as the hemodynamic deficit, which is kind of a, uh, a sum of the hemodynamic compromise and burden of an individual. And I think you can look at patients, whether it is cardiogenic shock or someone who is going to need support for another indication, and make a thoughtful decision about how much support that you're going to need to, to give to this patient. And so um, in, in doing this, certainly the technology, our our personal institutional technology we use, the Impella devices. So it certainly makes a difference with which device we use depending on what the deficit is. And, and similarly, in keeping with this, this is another tool that we use um, to make a, a thoughtful decision about which technology we're going to use. Cardiac power output came out of the, the shock trial data as a, a very potent indicator of, of mortality. And we can target our intervention based on initial cardiac power output. And importantly, I think um, one of the things with this is to assess the um, effect of your intervention, because certainly these patients are coming out uh, not uncommonly uh, with other devices, and you can assess the effect of your intervention and then make another decision about whether you need to um, proceed with another technology. So we've heard a lot of this, and this is some more of Dr. Sunagawa's data um, without the um, neuromodulation. But again, this goes to the fact that in the current era, the thinking is um, you know, full support, full unloading is what we're after. So there certainly is a difference in outcomes with full support, and there's a difference in the ability of the technology to provide full support and full unloading. So again, I think when we are assessing patients and making a decision about what we're going to do with respect to um, assessing the need for a different technology, we understand that certainly the more powerful device, the surgical device, is um, going to be the one that's going to approach the full support and full um, unloading. Now, the addition of the CP technology certainly has, I think, blurred this when our only options were the 2.5 and the 5.0, it was very clear. The CP device has certainly uh, is a powerful tool and certainly provides um, in oftentimes enough unloading and enough support. So I think, again, we go back to using the tools that we have, the cardiac power output, other hemodynamic parameters, to make the, the decision if we need to change technologies. So um, I, I think the concept of escalation of therapy is extremely important for a couple of reasons. Um, one of them is that uh, we published a paper uh, several years ago with AMI cardiogenic shock with the AB5000 device. And in, um, in that setting, we found that um, the, power, the more powerful surgical devices seem to be more effective with respect to recovery. Now, uh, it's common in our institution for patients to um, come to our ICU with an Impella 2.5 or a CP device in place. And then um, it's, we, it, that this kind of inertia sets in that, you know, the patient has a device, they're going to be fine, and you, you, we don't need to do anything more. But I think we're not doing the right thing for the patients in that setting. And um, being thoughtful about if you have truly unloaded them enough, if you are providing enough hemodynamic support for these patients, uh, assessing them and making an early decision to escalate therapy 
uh, is particularly uh, important with respect to uh, optimizing recovery and optimizing outcomes. I think the other part of this that's extremely important is the earlier time to decision to escalate therapy, both to initiate therapy and to escalate therapy is critical. But I think the concept of escalation of therapy is particularly important. The avoidance of kind of post-device inertia is extremely important. And <clears throat> and um, a collaborative approach to this and assessing patients after device therapy uh, is extremely important. And when we escalate, certainly we go to the surgical device and the most powerful device being the 5.0 device. Um, just some, some quick data. This is data from uh, uh, the, um, uh, the CVAD registry. The CVAD registry now, just to briefly uh, mention that, is, is a really important um, work that's being done now, a shift from the U.S. Pella registry to the now what's the global CVAD registry, which is, is going to be just that, a global registry for the Impella device with uh, significantly more data points that I think is going to allow us to really capture um, this data, more data to support the concept of recovery and to have more meaningful discussions hopefully next year at this meeting. But this is some data that was utilized to um, get the approval for the cardiogenic shock approval. And this is in post-cardiotomy patients, low cardiac output syndrome, cardiogenic shock, and the, the sickest patients being the failure to wean patients. And the 2.5 device and, and the 5.0 device um, were studied in this. And without going through the, um, all of the data, uh, just to show you some differences between the two devices. Now, again, this is, is survival data. It's not recovery data, but certainly survival data is, is quite important. And you can see the difference in outcomes, certainly in the cardiogenic shock and the failure to wean patients, the sicker patients being more profound with the more robust support and um, unloading effect. So again, it's a plug for, for the surgical or my surgical colleagues and the surgeons uh, that in these advanced cases, the surg surgeons still have a role. Um, I think uh, certainly percutaneous technology has been a big advance uh, in this. And, um, but however, there's certainly the downsides of, of percutaneous technology. One is you can see the, the video there about the potential instability of, of femoral artery placement. Two being the uh, restriction of the patient to being in bed with femoral artery placement. As I mentioned about the, the paper we, we published in Cardiogenic Shock, the average time to recovery in that paper was 30 days. So um, if you look at some of the data now, like the data I just showed you for the postcardiotomy shock, the average time of implant there is 60, 70 hours. So are we, are we affording these patients the adequate opportunity for recovery because we're, we're feeling compelled to pull the device from the groin? So um, axillary artery implant and, and the ability to place the device centrally has the capability of, of making the device quite stable, very durable, um, allows mobility, ambulation of patients, and it, it maximizes your opportunity for time to recovery. So I think axillary artery implantation and having your surgical colleagues being familiar with this is extremely uh, important. Lastly, there is a discussion about biventricular shock and right ventricular uh, failure later on, so I won't go into this um, extensively. But to say that true univentricular shock is, is, is less common than we thought. There's a couple of pieces of data here, some from Naveen and, and Noam and Dan that looked at, used our recover right um, trial, the, the um, criteria we use for RV failure in the recover right trial, and applied it to the shock trial um, registry and found you know, about a 50% incidence of, of right ventricular failure. And our paper, we had about a 50% interest. And if you look at the registry, it's about 50%. So there is a significant in incidence of, of, right, uh, of biventricular failure. And, you know, historically we had not had an opportunity or, or really any tools short of a surgical VAD and or medicine to, um, to treat these patients. But certainly now in the uh, era of the RP device, we have the capability of doing biventricular support. And certainly there's a lot of value to biventricular support. But obviously I think it's the, it's the optimal recovery uh, platform. And how does this relate to surgeons? I think it's important for surgeons to be able to collaborate with their uh, interventional cardiologist to help them put the RP device in. 
uh, lastly, I think it is important, and, and f as, a, as a surgeon and as a program, I think us having an algorithm and, and having a clinical approach to this has been extremely important. What it has maintained for us is a very kind of consistent systematic approach which is reproducible. And the, the, the other part of this which I think um, is, is it, it highlights is the role of a heart team or a shock team and a multidisciplinary uh, team to apply this algorithm to. So I think we have some um, very intriguing um, paradigm shifts that we're bringing up and discussing in, in the meeting. I think we heard a little bit this morning about some new technology, so whether in the current setting surgical unloading seems to be, or full unloading it seems to be the way to go. However, I think we'll be able to tailor that in the future with new technology to optimally unload. I think the early referral um, and early, uh, I'm sorry, late referral has to, we have to get away from that and, and consideration of early escalation. I think biventricular support uh, has a very big role and I, I think it's going to impact recovery uh, significantly and lastly that recovery is, is certainly possible and that uh, these devices should be bridge to recovery and not bridge to transplant. Thank you. I think we have time for a couple of questions. So as people move to the microphone, I'll take the first question, Mark, that was excellent presentation. So you showed the algorithm and uh, you mentioned the shock team. Do you see any challenges in uh, having uh, an active shock team 24-7 uh, and uh, do you actively do it in your institution and how is it working? And then number two, when the shock team meets, one of the criticisms I was giving a talk about it uh, from the audience was uh, too many cooks and difficult cases, not randomized data to guide the decisions of the shock team, which is of course why we need a shock team. So how do you challenge uh, these uh, criticisms? Yes, that's a, that's a very good question and I think it, ours, ours is, is a work in progress because oftentimes this occurs at two in the morning and, and some of the fundamental members of the shock team uh, aren't there. So I, I think it's, um, you know, you, you have a couple, always most institutions have some, some real, I, I think, people that want to move this concept forward that are, are available and want to be involved and uh, assist in this. What this is kind of uh, I would say almost devolved into is kind of the morning after discussion about escalation, was the patient, you know, should we put the swan in? So I think um, it, it, there's a couple different iterations you can have of a shock team. If you have a, a, the, a capability to have a 24-7 shock team, that's ideal. In reality, that's, that's challenging to do, but I think if you're able to put together some people that are, are really um, you know, want to move this forward, want to collaborate and interact, you can have a, a positive outcome in, you know, kind of sticking to the, the algorithms and, and making the appropriate decisions. Mark, um, Mark, I've been at uh, three institutions in the last 15 years, and uh, I haven't been able to get our heart surgeons to operate on patients in cardiogenic shock, and I think it's primarily because um, of the report card worry. I mean, they're all absolutely paranoid about outcome data and, and reporting and really systematically, but uh, there's a lot of basic science suggesting that complete unloading with, with femoral femoral bypass and cardioplegic arrest and then reperfusing in a controlled environment uh, could actually be incredibly beneficial. But, I mean, is there, is there an appetite in the surgical community? A patient comes in 70 years old, severe three vessel disease, cardiogenic shock, in taking those patients to emergency surgery. Does that ever happen anywhere? No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, you know, so it, it, that's not entirely true. But, um, but what I would say, so how that is, has, you know, manifest or how it's evolved for us is when you call me about that patient, I tell you to either put a CP in them or I'll take them and put a, uh, a 5 in them and then we let them sit for a couple of days and unload them and then operate on them. So I, I think the concept of the cardioplegic arrest unloading and reperfusing is intriguing, but that's going, like uh, I think some of the trials we're trying to talk about design going to be different, difficult to get people to do. But I do think there's value in fixing the culprit, unloading a couple of days, taking them to surgery, then supported is, is a very nice strategy to, 
to treat those patients. Um, Mark, um, regarding uh, postcardiotomy failure, what, what's your strategy? Is it, is, uh, there's still the balloon pump, which plays a certain role in surgery, versus impella, versus uh, uh, ECMO. Uh, and then, of course, uh, using impella more and more, probably then all the surgical suites should be at least equipped with a CR, because I mean, obviously you need some fluoroscopy to place the impella device. Yes, uh, I, I agree with you. So there's, there's two things there. Um, one, we rarely use ECMO just because it's, you're already in a coagulopathic, you know, challenging environment and putting them on ECMO generally results in, you know, a very labor intensive experience. So there's, there's two um, approaches. One is the prophylactic approach in a high risk case where I personally will, you know, put a wire in, put an introducer in, put a wire in. Uh, and actually get it across the aortic valve up front. And then if I need the device to come off, it, the wire's there, you can clamp it, do your case, and if, if I suspect that I'm going to need it, I can just put the device in. But when I'm not expecting it, um, and I needed something to come off, in general, I'm doing central uh, placement with the graft onto the aorta, and you can do it really with TEE and kind of by hand, so you don't need trans um, the C-arm. Certainly C-arm is helpful, especially for peripheral placement, but in, in that setting, when it's failure to wean unanticipated, I would put the device in centrally. What, you also use the 5.0 device then? Yeah. yeah. One of the challenges we face is a patient who has a 3-5 and they need escalation of care, uh, convincing our surgeons to put in a 5-0. Because uh, their traditional thinking is, well, it's, it's not going to add much therapy, it's another liter and a half, why not just put a VAT in him uh, to get him over the hump or even use ECMO as complementary to that uh, using ECMO and Impella. Uh, any thoughts on that? Yeah, so I, I think that um, certainly to go ahead and put a durable bat in them is, is not appropriate um, unless there's some extenuating circumstances where you know there's no chance for recovery and this patient was headed there in the first place. Um, second of all, I think you can thoughtfully look at it with hemodynamics and echocardia and image them and see if, you know, your unloading is enough unloading and or assessing your mixed venous and if your support and perfusion is adequate. So you have some ammunition to say, hey, look, you, you need to escalate therapy uh, in this patient. So I think um, the more kind of ammunition you have and, and if you're able to have a multidisciplinary discussion about it, um, that you can really make a thoughtful, you know, argument to escalate therapy. But I, I do agree with you, and that's what I was mentioning, that inertia, once you get a device in, it's like, that's it. And then the other flip side of that is we take it out three days later, too, which is not always necessarily appropriate. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mark.